Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, we'll probably have some more, hopefully have some more people get on as we get started here. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. And, and I appreciate hopefully good morning or good afternoon to wherever you're, you're, you're uh, joining us from. So um, we are very excited about this journal club today. I'm going to share my screen here. All right. Um, and so but just uh, first and foremost, want to say, of course, this is uh, sponsored by the sort of PD ECMO group, uh, which for those of you that are not familiar with it, it is um, part of a joint subgroup between Polisi and ELSO that is really focused on uh, how we collaborate with each other and 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 do the best research that we can for for patients that require uh, our pediatric patients that are requiring ECMO. Um, we have subgroup meetings at Polisi every year and at ELSO every year, um, and so we will be having one coming up uh, in March at the Polisi meeting. Um, so be on the lookout for that uh, information about that meeting. If you'd like to join, we will of course have a virtual option if you're not able to to make it to the meeting um, this year. And then um, also be on the lookout this year for more journal clubs uh, and webinars throughout the year. We hope to keep doing these um, and love to hear feedback. We also encourage feedback um, and uh, participation during this. It's very laid back. And so authors love the questions and things like that. So, so please participate and you can either, and, and if you will do that by just throwing something in the chat, we've got somebody that's monitoring the chat so they can sort of uh, jump in for a good time for questions. So, um, so let's get started. So uh, I want to, first of all, thank uh, the, the doctors that are helping us uh, go through the journal today, um, Dr. Coney and Dr. Barbero. Um, they are on the line with us here. And so we're um, reviewing their article, which they did with several other um, authors as well, too, um, that was put out last year, um, looking at at the tracheostomy practices and outcomes in children that were requiring um, respiratory ECMO. Um, and so I think our first question to you guys uh, is, is really what was the personal motivation for you guys to, to do this study? Yeah, uh, thank you. And just before we get started, I want to say um, thank you to um, the folks that organized this. Um, and then everybody for joining, uh, you know, I recognize a lot of uh, ECMO expert names uh, on the list that have already joined. And so, um, I, as has been mentioned, I welcome any kind of questions that come in. Um, uh, and yeah, I think uh, I'm excited to hear about others. Uh, you know, I think leading into that question, I think one of the uh, biggest motivators of this is wanting to be a part of the conversation um, around how do we best take care of kids uh, that are on longer ECMO runs uh, for respiratory support. Um, and uh, and so I'm hopeful and then this is I'm excited that this paper has kind of stimulated this conversation. Um, so really, I think the the biggest motivator for us in doing this um, was, uh, you know, it came it became a topic of conversation in many of our longer run respiratory ECMO. Um, as a fellow and kind of moving into a junior faculty uh, role, um, you know, you have kids that are on uh, ECMO for a prolonged period of time. Um, and I wanted to, I think, better understand. Uh, so I think, you know, we would often have conversations, is a trach great for this kid? Should we be doing a trach at this, uh, at this time? And really just felt like those were pretty uninformed conversations. We didn't have an idea of how many people are doing this, uh, what are the risks associated with doing this, and what what is happening to these kids after a tracheostomy. Um, and so, uh, as we'll mention kind of later in one of the, it actually started out by asking, this was pretty early in the pandemic of what's happening in adult COVID. Um, and then from there, really wanted to kind of land on the question that um, as pediatric intensivists that I think we face more often, um, what's happening in our longer run pediatric respiratory ECMO cases. Um, and so, you know, we'll mention again later some of the other studies that have been um, done in this area and was, you know, excited with Dr. Mallory and Dr. Friedman, who are both helped with this paper uh, and one of the pediatric hey, experts that they had uh, started that, uh, around the conversation of tracheostomies and kids after ECMO and wanted to, I think, understand to what was happening during ECMO and using the ELSO as a resource. Great. 
Um, and what about within your institution? You mentioned having these conversations, but is it a pretty common practice to, to do tracheostomies on these patients? Or is that something that was very debatable still? So, you know, I think the number of hours of conversation that we have around a uh, tracheostomy versus the times we've actually done it um, is uh, way overshadowed uh, for one or the other. So, yes, it is something that we've done. I would say similar to our um, what the rest of the ELSO centers and in, in the data that we show, um, it doesn't happen often. Um, and so I would say it's not common. Um, it's something that we have done. Um, it is something that I think that we talk about in nearly every long run uh, pediatric uh, respiratory ECMO patient. Yeah, I think probably most of us would have a similar experience, but always want to know what are other places doing and how are they handling these these conversations. So that's why it's a great article. Um, so so you mentioned some of the other research and and you do you do kind of touch on this in your article um, and and you say that the evidence around tracheostomies in pediatric ECMO patients is really limited. So but what has prior work told us in this field? Yeah, so um, yeah, I mentioned uh, the first article there. So that was a um, a product of uh, this group here, the the PD ECMO group um, and Polizzi, uh, and really led by Dr. Mallory and Dr. Freeman that I had not uh, previously worked with before this project and was excited uh, that I had the chance to work with them. Um, and so their work really showed um, of, so looking at uh, 10 centers uh, that, all of the children in that cohort received a tracheostomy after ECMO. Um, and that number was about uh, 13%, um, which I think is a really important patient-centered uh, outcome um, of an understanding you know, the risks of a patient that's on ECMO. I think for a family deciding and for clinicians deciding whether or not that's uh, that ECMO is in line with uh, what they're hoping for their child and are we achieving the outcomes that we're hoping towards? I think knowing the, the risks of long-term mechanical ventilation after ECMO is really important. Um, and so that was an important um, uh, study that they had put out. Um, and then others as well. Uh, so the, the last paper that you'd mentioned there is also looking at practices after ECMO. Um, and then from Duke as well, the middle paper, the bedside tracheostomy, um, they do show that like there are centers in case series that have shown that this, this can be done um, and can be done safely and describe some of the risks and the patients that they have chosen this on. Um, and so all of these papers have been really helpful in I think understanding uh, practices at, uh, you know, either uh, at centers, uh, single centers or at uh, kind of larger cohorts. Um, and what we thought our paper would add to that literature is understanding the, uh, you know, using the ELSA registry, using a place where you can look at 400 centers and multi, uh, an international cohort of understanding what practices uh, were like uh, really around the world. Yeah, definitely. Um, and um, the, um, so for your paper, just kind of going through what you guys did, you actually used the ELSO uh, registry as a data source. Um, and you looked at patients that were less, teen, less than 18 years of age. Um, and this was from 20, 2015 to 2019. And they were on ECMO at least seven days. Um, and you looked at some primary outcomes and some secondary outcomes. And so just in general, what using the ELSO registry, what what are the strengths about uh, using doing a study like this with the, with a registry like this? Yeah, and I just want to, I saw there was a comment in there from uh, Joanne Starr. That's something that I think uh, as we get into the data as well, I completely agree uh, and our data uh, shows as well. Um, so I, I, this is, uh, I really enjoyed using the ELSA registry um, for this study. You know, I got my start in research using administrative databases and was always trying to um, use data that was collected for a different reason um, than uh, to try and answer a, a clinical question. Um, and the ELSA registry was uh, a really responsive um, for, you know, especially early, the, again, the first kind of uh, cohort that we tried to look at this question in um, was the adult COVID patients. Um, quick, uh, responsive, uh, the data is validated uh, and clean in a way, and it's collected for, I think, these types of uh, investigations. And so it really was a great registry as a kind of junior clinical investigator to work with. 
Um, so I really, uh, and then again, the, the strength is just getting this picture at a wide variety of centers in many different places, um, rather than kind of a selected um, cohort to really have the, the breadth of practices across ELSO was really helpful. Um, yeah. what, what about the challenges with working with this type of registry? I think just building out what Joe says, I mean, obviously, you know, some of the previous studies that you showed, especially some of those single center studies, there's a lot more opportunity uh, to dig into the depth, I think, what of uh, the individual patient course and understand the variety of details. It's not going to be there in the ELSA registry, which is a pragmatic registry and uh, asks a lot of questions around uh some outcome related stuff, but not as much around course and decision making, obviously, is going to be lost in the ELSO registry. Um, but like Joe said already, uh, there's there's so many centers that you're at least uh, able to see some of the practice patterns um, and get that kind of that breadth of experience. But in terms of other yeah. weaknesses, Joe, that you recognized? Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the things that we had initially started the conversation with uh, in answering this question was, you know, I think the uh, the most important thing that I would love to answer in this um, is, should a patient receive a tracheostomy? Um, and who is the right patient to receive a tracheostomy? And we talked about, are there ways that we can kind of do more uh, other approaches to try and answer those questions, including um, causal inference, um, ways of kind of using this observational data in a way that could uh, lead to some bigger conclusion. And I think the the registry um, was has really great clinical detail. Um, however, the ability to kind of get that, as uh, Ryan mentioned, that granularity of the decision making um, that was included in there just wasn't, uh, weren't able to kind of do that type of study within this data. And so really focused on informing the the kind of clinical decisions with the outcomes that were available. Um, and then I think, you know, we are, it's not a, a tracheostomy specific um, registry. And so some of the, when you look at the, like, what are the specific risks and what are the specific benefits that we'd want to evaluate from a tracheostomy? We don't have data about their, um, the kind of type of sedation medications used, whether there was a um, decrease in sedation, if that was a stated goal. And then as we get to in some of the bleeding outcomes uh, as well, uh, you know, ELSA records and tracks the bleeding amount um, by volume. Um, and so that volume amount, while it certainly could be significant, um, you know, 50 cc's of blood in your airway um, versus in your brain versus on the bed are going to have very different uh, patient impacts. Um, and so the volume, I think, I think is a real limitation um, of some of our bleeding outcomes. Sure. Well, when you, after doing this study with this registry, any words of wisdom for people that are interested in doing as, uh, you know, using the ELSA registry or really any database like this to, to do research? Yeah, I think it's a really, for something that's, uh, you know, like ECMO that is so uh, center specific, I think it's a really great opportunity to be able to understand practices, uh, how other places are doing it. Um, and so it's a, uh, again, as a junior investigator, it was a really fantastic, uh, it was a really fantastic study to do. So I would say, um, go for it. I think the other benefit of uh, you are, uh, ELSA requires you to have multi-centers uh, involved, uh, and so wouldn't have gotten to work with uh, people like Dr. Uh, McLaren, Mallory, Friedman, uh, others that I've kind of met through this project uh, that I hope to continue to work with in the future. And so uh, it's a really great, uh, it's a really great thing. I'd encourage you to do for it and happy to talk to anybody that's uh, junior on this call or that's interested in working more with it uh, about some of those experiences. Yeah, well, it definitely seems like it's been uh productive for you guys and, and giving us some good information, which is great. Yeah. Um, so getting into the study, it looks like you guys uh, just looked at patients with respiratory failure as their primary diagnosis. Is there, um, were you worried you might be missing some patients that got tracheostomies that that had a listing of something else that was a, a, a primary diagnosis? Yeah, so uh, we wanted to try and really narrow this down as, as uh, to the patients where we feel like there's that uh, 
as much as we can to kind of enrich the cohort to be the group that we would consider most at risk of uh, getting a tracheostomy. Um, and so that is where we, you know, decided to focus strictly on respiratory failure, not that kids that are supported for cardiac indications wouldn't benefit from a tracheostomy or wouldn't be at risk, uh, but felt that that path towards tracheostomy would be different than what we would consider or discuss in our kind of typical uh, respiratory ECMO patient. So we wanted to include both VA and VV support uh, because it can be used uh, for kids with respiratory indications, but wanted to really focus on a, a respiratory indication um, as our cohort. Okay, great. Well, let's actually kind of look through some of the results uh, in the um, uh, sort of what you guys found. So this is the first table in the paper uh, and it shows us patient characteristics. Characteristics. Can you tell us about any major trends? Yeah, so I think this is getting at that question, and I see some other um, comments that are uh, coming through in the chat there, and so happy to uh, talk about those. But I think uh, from Dr. Starr that had mentioned that, uh, like, so I think really what we're seeing uh, in the patients that received a tracheostomy on ECMO support, they looked more like uh, adult patients. So they were the adolescent um, patients. Um, so if you look at our median age range in the kids who didn't receive a trach on ECMO was 1.7 years uh, and who did receive a tracheostomy on ECMO was 14.7 years. So they're more likely to be an adolescent patient and more likely to be supported on uh, VV support. Uh, and so I think this, this really was, uh, I think, confirmed a suspicion uh, that we had is that this, um, you know, this is a practice that's much more common in adult respiratory ECMO. Um, and so in the, the adult COVID paper that we did, it was about a third uh, of those patients received a uh, tracheostomy on ECMO. Um, and the patients in the pediatric population as highlighted by this table that are receiving a tracheostomy on ECMO, I think more closely resemble that adult population. So they're the adolescent supported on VV um, is the biggest take home message from this. Okay. Um, and then um, just moving on real quick, uh, and then we'll, let's see. So the, the second uh, table here is, is sort of the outcomes that you guys had uh, in, your, in your patients. Um, and so, you know, tell us about some of the findings around the primary and secondary outcomes. And then um, I'm going to let Matt sort of take over with questions from there. And, and I think he's got at least one question from the chat to kind of talk through. Yeah. Yeah, so I think um, it is important, and again, I want to um, kind of emphasize our um, our goal in presenting. Of, I think you flipped back um, yep, from the, the table. Thanks. Um, so that in presenting this, you know, this isn't meant to be a uh, this isn't meant to be a um, uh, kind of true comparison, assuming that these are going to be equal populations. I think the outcomes that we're seeing really do reflect um, the different patient populations that are included in these cohorts. Um, but I felt like it was helpful context to know what is happening in the general cohort, uh, and then what are the outcomes in these, uh, the patients specifically that received a tracheostomy on ECMO. Um, and so starting, you know, kind of with the, uh, at the top, the mortality uh, overall there is, uh, is roughly the same. Um, and so in the patients that received a tracheostomy, and it is important to know that like this is 94 uh, patients. And I think that is one of the, the real take home messages um, uh, is that it's around 3% of that total cohort when you look at just the, the uh, non neonatal, so over 28 days, it's 5% of the total cohort. So this is remains an uncommon procedure um, on ECMO. Um, and so the hospital mortality is roughly the same. Again, I think that really reflects, does reflect the patients that are receiving this. Um, uh, surgical site bleeding. And so again, I, with the caveats um, that I mentioned as far as uh, the bleeding, so the bleeding rate in um, for pediatrics is greater than 20 per kilo in 24 hours or greater than three adult units of PRBCs. Um, and so surgical site bleeding within a tracheostomy that doesn't reach that threshold may still be significant. Um, it's also not tied to any specific procedure. Um, and so uh, it is, um, again, I, there's, I think it's an important outcome and it's the kind of most 
I think, disgust and feared outcome. And I think there's, uh, so within the adult COVID uh, study that we did, 10% of that cohort had surgical site bleeding. Um, and this, if you looked at the numbers of pre and post, I uh, feel like it's roughly around that space as well, 12%. Um, however, again, that's not specifically linked to uh, the uh, tracheostomy. And then I think looking down uh, towards the bottom of the table, um, you know, I think the motivation in uh, to do a tracheostomy typically is to, uh, or the, the kind of proposed benefits would be to establish a more awake state um, with the ability to then mobilize and rehabilitate your patient on ECMO uh, and with the idea that you'll have better recovery um, and outcomes. And so that was, we felt like a really important thing to describe is are we achieving that target in these patients? The caveats again, also only asks for the uh, rehabilitation uh, outcome to be recorded in patients that are greater than eight. Um, and so that is missing a, a portion of that cohort and then started collecting that data in 2018. Um, and so we just report that for 2018 and 2019. So I do think this will be something that kind of moving forward will be uh, a really good thing to, uh, to look at. Um, but it does seem like, uh, I guess, depending on how you interpret this, um, we are achieving rehabilitation in half of the patients. Uh, however, if your primary motivation in putting a tracheostomy in is to achieve rehabilitation. I think you can also interpret that as we didn't achieve it in half of the patients that we tried to put this in, uh, and it has reasonable risks of bleeding. Um, and so again, I think these numbers will hopefully in better inform a conversation around tracheostomy, but certainly is not the, uh, uh, the, the last study that's needed in this area. I wonder if I could just echo some of the things that Joe had said. I think when we were thinking about why do this study, uh, as Joe said, we hope to kind of make some comparisons, but as has been highlighted by some of the questions um, that, you know, before just, there just wasn't the depth in terms of clinical course for patients for us to feel comfortable with those comparisons. And so we wanted to at least be able to give some overview of what some of the risks and benefits that we as clinicians might think about when we're counseling or making clinical decisions. And as Joe said, I mean, the most obvious is bleeding related to the tracheostomy itself. Uh, Joe will probably talk about or has talked about some of the limitations and our ability to discern that. But the second thing is, were there other complications that we may or may not anticipate broadly um, that are on this table that were different between the groups so that we would know that going forward? And then in terms of the benefits, uh, as was stated, you know, we think about this, or at least at our bedside conversations when we think about this talking about exactly what Joe said is, you know, mobilizing the patient and hopefully that kind of wakefulness and rehabilitation uh, facilitates recovery, uh, which, you know, works towards survival. And so just thinking along this path is why, you know, some of the things that are on this table are on this table. Great. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Matt, I don't know if you want to go through. Sure, thank you. <clears throat> and I'm Matt. I'm one of the intensivists in Arkansas. So Dr. Siddiqui from Arkansas Children's um, has a really important question. You know, it's, it's not in the meat of this paper, but it's a very important question. So I'm sure you can read it, but I'll read it out loud. So sometimes a rate limiting step is nursing comfort with tracheotomy care close to the cannulation site in the right internal jugular vein. Any insight or suggestions on how to get nursing education or care supported for optimal success with trachs on ECMO? Yeah, um, and I would welcome others that, again, as I, you know, I think I have clinical experience with just uh, several of these, um, and so I know there are people on the, this call that probably had, do have a lot more experience um, and would welcome any suggestions that others have. I really, we have a fantastic group of ECMO specialists here um, that have done, uh, in the times that we've done it, have been really great with, uh, you know, kind of owning the ECMO uh, cannula and making sure that any of the kind of trach uh, ties uh, are, um, you know, not interfering with the, uh, the ECMO cannula. Um, and then typically in that kind of fresh tracheostomy time uh, period, they're often uh, sutured in place. Uh, and so those have been the, the kind of few experiences I've had, but I, I really would welcome uh, and encourage others that may have more experience to, to weigh in. I think the other thing I would just build on there is, you know, one of the, at our own institution, 
we are uh, have our ECMO specialists work across our adult and pediatric hospital. And so while, you know, within our hospital, uh, we may have a limited number of tracheostomies, uh, certainly it is more common in our adult group. And I think uh, our bedside nursing staff really has benefited uh, by the reassurance uh, from our ECMO specialists and their experience on the adult side. Um, and, you know, of course, the, or not necessarily, of course, but within our hospital, the discipline of, of the ECMO specialists can be nurses or respiratory therapists and occasionally perfusionists, but predominantly nurses and respiratory therapists. And so I think there's, there's an easy ability for folks to speak to one another as well. Yeah, I think it's a good point. You know, we've only done a, a handful here in, in Little Rock, but I think it's a great idea to, to have that pre- determined care and maybe even simulation could help with that in terms of if there is some discomfort between bedside team members versus the team. I think that's a good point. Does anybody else on the call have anything with uh, their nursing experience, the bedside team members? All right. Um, Amanda Ruth has some good questions. Um, do you have more granular data on the diagnosis of those with trachs? Um, so at their center, they move towards trach more aggressively or quickly in lung transplant recipient or potential lung transplant patients. So wondering if there's something that might push others towards trach versus another disease process. Yeah, that's a really great question. And I don't, um, within, this, uh, within this study, we didn't look at individual diagnoses beyond the initial uh, respiratory indication um, to talk about, uh, is it uh, more in patients that are potential for lung transplant. Um, however, I think uh, that's a really great thought. And I think that I would suspect uh, that that would be the case as well um, with this longer um, longer run, older uh, child uh, cohort. I think that uh, that I would believe oh, that. Jeff, you might, yeah. I, I think though, that is definitely though in the ELSA registry. So one of the nice things uh, about the ELSA registry is it does collect a lot of ICD related diagnostic information that would let you drill into mm -hmm. each patient along that if that was an interest for uh, other investigations. Um, and additionally, there is a dedicated field to, you know, was this patient being bridged to lung transplant as well? And so those kinds of questions actually are answerable in the registry. As Joe said, it was something that we looked at uh, in particular, uh, but I think those are really important questions. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing I would say in terms of, you know, uh, that, uh, that piece around bridge to lung transplant is that's, ex you know, exceedingly uncommon, like tracheostomy as well, though, uh, in our ECMO patients. And so, you know, some recent uh, reviews that have been done have, have shown that really when you're talking about kids that are less than 18 years old, we're talking about dozens of kids here that are being bridged to lung transplant, um, at least within the United States. Excellent, thank you. Um, and Amanda Ruth has another follow-up question. Um, do you have further data on the surgical site bleeding caused complications like circuit changes, transfusion burden on the patient and the extent of complications if or when they happen? Yeah, so, um, uh, so I think that's a really great point. And we have the, the kind of data that's presented in this table as to the extent with which we uh, kind of broke down those complications. Um, and so, you know, like the mechanical complications that are presented there, um, you see more kind of mechanical complications uh, over the course of the run, the total run, um, which I think is reflects that these uh, are the longer run patients. Um, however, the overall rate of complications um, was roughly similar um, between those two. Um, and so I think this is getting at the kind of granular level of data that I think really does impact care that we we don't have at this um, within this site or within this study, but I think, uh, you know, future studies would certainly benefit from having that information. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Furlong Dillard from Louisville asked, because um, you do mention this briefly in the um, in the paper, but would love to hear what you had to say versus uh, on percutaneous tracheostomy versus surgical open tracheostomy. Yeah, um, so it's a really great, and I think that is another, so that is uh, the, both of those uh, procedures were coded the same, and so there wasn't a way to, within this data, determine which is which. Um, there is, uh, 
you'll find a lot more kind of adult uh, experience. Um, and I've heard really good arguments for both. And so I think, um, you know, in either procedure, um, the ability to control bleeding is going to be the most important uh, aspect. Um, as a, as a non-proceduralist, as a person who's not doing these tracheostomies, and I do, I think there's some surgeons on the call as well that I'd welcome to weigh in. Um, I've heard a lot of good experience with the, uh, the percutaneous uh, tracheostomy and minimizing bleeding uh, in these larger uh, adolescent adult-sized patients. Um, I think I've also heard arguments as well that the ability to do the procedure um, open uh, with uh, electrocautery uh, as you do it uh, is also the best way to control bleeding. Um, and I think beyond uh, whether or not we should of how is the, is the next really important question. And I think I've seen a lot of center experiential data, uh, but would welcome others uh, if they have strong preference or, or other risk factors that um, would push them to do one or the other. Yeah, I know that was a active discussion at our center when we started doing it um, during the COVID pandemic. And I reached out to a lot of different centers and very, each center has their own very strong preferences. Um, we, we decided to go to an open surgical approach just for that. You're exactly right for the uh, electrocautery and control of bleeding. But I do know some centers who are successful with the percutaneous with the like blue rhino kits and things like that. Um, anybody else on the call have any thoughts about their experience with this? It's a quiet group. I think just sort of what you've mentioned is that it's it it is fewer and far between for our group, especially not being a transplant center. So, you know, sometimes we'll transfer them to a transplant center and let them do the surgical procedures that they want to do. Um, and so we have been having more of these discussions over the last few years as well. And and so I'm not sure, you know, people are asking for protocols and things like that. And and maybe bigger centers would have them. Um, you know, the, if they've been doing a more or places that are really bridging kids to transplant in-house um, would have them as well. Um, and so anybody that has anything that's willing to share, just you guys are welcome to either drop it in the chat if there's a link or you can email the PDF uh, education Gmail account um, and we can we can share them. Um, but I think it's hard to say that we have like a standardized practice. We tend to also in, in Charleston also do um, the open technique as opposed to percutaneous as well. All right, these are some great questions. Uh, they're still coming. Um, can you maybe discuss the benefits either from experience or from data of tracheostomy versus extubating the patient in particular for those who are able to participate in lung clearance on their own? Yeah, so I think this is a really, uh, so this gets down to, I think, uh, you know, like clinically, what do we do uh, now and what do we practically do moving forward, um, which I think, you know, I know we'll have planned to talk about uh, later. And so, uh, you know, I think this is the, um, so I, I think in these discussions, so I think what I have, I feel like we can have better informed discussions now around a tracheostomy on ECMO. Um, and I think there are certain patients that it will benefit. Um, and I think the benefits that I can see um, potentially would be uh, reduced sedation and uh, mobilization as a path to uh, recovery. Um, and so I think as the kind of question is getting at is there's a couple of different ways to get at that. Um, and so I think before any decision of whether or not you're going to do a tracheostomy, I think determining whether you think that the feasibility of actually participating in rehab um, and being able to achieve that wakeful state um, is possible with a tracheostomy um, uh, or with extubation as well. Um, and so I think a the facilitated, I think the, the uh, more and more kind of in a non-ECMO population, uh, a calm, awakeful uh, state is going to be the uh, the kind of ideal. And I think that should be the the standard that we all like work towards. Um, and I think there, if you can achieve that without a tracheostomy, uh, I think there 
you know, certainly could be an argument to be made for that. I think if you think that the breathing tube is really the, the piece that's keeping you from being able to achieve that common wakeful state uh, and being able to have a patient participate in rehab, then I think that is a patient where you could consider the uh, a tracheostomy uh, and that the, the risks may uh, be outweighed by the potential benefits. Ryan, do you feel yeah, I mean, in terms of extubation, uh, just transparently, we have we talk about it. We haven't done it. Uh, I think you know. I think that the places where it seems to make the most sense to me uh, are an asthmatic, where you know they're probably going to stay open, uh, and you're not going to worry about collapse, uh, or somebody you know with reasonable compliance, but some kind of significant uh, need for support of gas exchange um, in that in that manner, but. I think where I worry about it a little bit is uh, in terms of extubation, if uh, if I was thinking about this in a center where we were doing it, would be, you know, that patient who you've got open on positive pressure and you think would probably collapse uh, at well, positive pressure, I'm not thinking twice about extubation, but in a collapsed patient or a patient who I think, you know, is more on that asthmatic spectrum and will keep their lungs open, obstructive disease, I, I uh, we have talked about it. Uh, several times, and hopefully we'll, we'll push forward to doing that. I've definitely talked to centers who have had good success with it as well, and, and I think it's I think it's a great option uh, avoiding a procedure and you know kind of getting to the same benefits that that Joe has mentioned already. Love to hear people. If, um, I'm sure there's somebody on the call who's who's done this. Uh, love to hear their kind of comments. Hey, uh, Matt Freeman from Riley. Um, Really good stuff, Joe and, and Ryan. Um, so yeah, we've extubated a handful of times on ECMO. Um, we've kind of swung from uh, trying to extubate to tracheostomy as kind of our standard. I think everything's going to be individualized to the patient. But as a you know a route to as a getting free from an endotracheal tube, our main approach uh, we was, was we tried extubation a few years ago, ran into some issues, and, and now we're leaning more towards trach. And I think one of the big things what Joe talked about is, is as far as measuring your goals and the time frame for those goals. I think extubation uh, likely doesn't, as long as your ventilator settings are low, you, you, I think the extubation doesn't really improve, free you from ventilator-induced lung injury. In fact, you're probably actually worsening uh, patients that are, uh, we've had some patients with severe negative pressure breathing that we likely did more harm than good by extubating. Um, so you have to think about that. So the real benefit is, is, the, is the wake mobile ECMO option. Uh, and in, in, our, in our limited experience, it takes weeks to get there. Um, so if you think you, so if the, to excavate a patient on ECMO and have them walking like all the pretty pictures you see on the internet, and when you go to ELSO, uh, that's not going to happen the next day. That's going to take a couple of weeks. So I think, you know, in a, in a patient that you, you anticipate weeks to months more, longer duration and a patient you think you can uh, effectively wean the sedation, um, and a patient who doesn't have excessive negative pressure breathing, I think those are the criteria I look for uh, when considering extubating a patient. Thanks, Matt. And thanks also for, uh, I mean, really, I think, inspiring this study, uh, you know, through your original prospective uh, or retrospective observational cohort that you put together and the, the questions that stem from that uh, inspired this. So thanks, Matt. Great. Thank you guys so much. Um, we'll do one more question from the chat, then I'm going to get some of the pre-submitted questions, then we can come back to the chat questions if we have time. And I think this is an interesting one. Um, from Danielle Duchette in Boston. So do you think the individual center's approach to anticoagulation strategies played into the bleeding complications or like thereof? And we talk about this a lot at our center as well. Yeah, so I, I, uh, it's a great question. One that I think there, uh, the limitations in uh, anticoagulation data within uh, the registry, um, I think not able to kind of answer that with this, um, uh, with this cohort um, from, uh, again, the adult cohort in that uh, kind of PEDS case series, uh, it seems like almost everyone holds anticoagulation around the time of procedure and for a variable time after. Um, however, I think, yes, there absolutely is um, going to be center variation in anticoagulation, which I think could absolutely uh, affect whether or not you have uh, bleeding after. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that's that's a really great question as well, and certainly should be part of any um, uh, kind of study moving forward. Yeah, I think um, it's probably beyond the scope of our discussion, and, and will probably get us way into the weeds of anticoagulation. But um, 
I think it's an important one, and we've <clears throat> we've you know moved towards using non heparin uh, for our trach patient for the perioperative procedure at least, for, like by Valerie. Matt, Alrighty. I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I said nothing. I just said, are we obligated to get into the weeds of anticoagulation? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about ECMO, I think that's true. It's a prerequisite. Um, so this kind of goes along to the, the the bleeding. So in the one of the questions is uh, in regard to the surgical site bleeding co cohort. You mentioned that it's impossible to determine the exact site of the bleeding, and therefore hard to say where the bleeding was from the procedure or the tracheostomy or not. Hmm. Would it have been possible to further evaluate this group by looking to see if additional surgical procedures were performed and compare them to those? whose only procedure was the tracheostomy to maybe further delineate whether the bleeding was from the trach procedure? Yeah, yes, it's a really good question. And we did um, start to uh, kind of, when we were interpreting this data to think about uh, the levels of, or the, the other surgical procedures that these patients had. Um, I think the numbers start to get really small as you, uh, you know, when we're looking at these, it's, uh, uh, you know, 24 patients out of the 94 um, that had surgical site bleeding and so started to feel a little bit more um, describing a, a case series rather than anything uh, kind of at the more population level. Uh, and so elected to not include uh, that other other procedures that folks had, but tried to give as much granularity as we could in that, uh, again, the, it's just it recorded as occurrences. Um, and so not uh, linked to any procedure. Um, so just whether there was bleeding that was documented pre-tracheostomy at a surgical site, um, which uh, hopefully, you know, gives a little bit of granularity into when that bleeding happened, but it, it is very much limited uh, by the data that we had. Yeah, I thought it was interesting how you guys broke it down from all bleeding from surgical sites and then pre-trach and, and after trach. So that can help maybe inform that decision some as well. Um, it sorry, go ahead. The way the data is entered into the registry. And so there are CPT codes uh, for whether procedures are done with dates related to them. Uh, and then there are complication codes about whether there was surgical site bleeding. But there's nothing that says, like, just because you had surgical site bleeding and you had a surgery, you know, that it was from that particular surgery. Now, if you only had one, that narrows it down a bit. But uh, once you have multiple, it's just hard for us to discern. Hard not possible for us to genuinely say. Sure. So um, ECMO duration in survivors was longer in patients who received a tracheostomy compared to those who did not. Any thoughts on to causality here, why this occurred? Yeah, I think this really, as I as I mentioned, I think this is a um, a function of the patients that we are, uh, that are receiving a tracheostomy. So I think, you know, as uh, in one of the other tables that shows the kind of breakdown between uh, the less than 14 days and greater than 14 days. Uh, I think there's, you know, with two kind of general themes in how we're approaching this, but I think overall that uh, the longer ECMO duration, I think is reflective of uh, if someone's gonna be on for a short run and the clinicians at the bedside know that, we're not able to tell that from the registry, but the clinicians at the bedside likely know uh, that uh, you're not gonna do a tracheostomy in that patient. Um, I think similarly, if the patient's likely to, it's one of the reasons that we elected to only look at um, uh, greater than seven days um, is wanted to try and weed out the population where you clinicians at the bedside know that patient's going to have a short run and that patient really wouldn't be at risk of tracheostomy or clinicians at the bedside really think that this is going to be a, a more of patient that's not going to get better. You also wouldn't do a tracheostomy in that patient. So to try and get at this as much as we can of like at an enriched cohort where it's truly a clinicians, reasonable clinicians at the bedside would have this discussion. Um, and so I think that is reflective of these are typically being done in longer run patients, um, which I think, you know, as, it, as you, uh, just to kind of move on here to this the table that you're presenting now, table three. So we did um, kind of a priori try to uh, look at uh, the differences in the practices between those who received a tracheostomy, what we described as like early and late. Um, and so uh, this is in much of the adult respiratory failure literature, there's some time between 10 and 14 days, it seems to be more on the 10 day size uh, when they're the kind of early versus late tracheostomy um, is described. And that's from the start of mechanical ventilation. Uh, what we describe here is that from the 
start of ECMO um, and looked at the practices of those that uh, received tracheostomy early and those that received a tracheostomy late. And so again, I'm, I'm putting that in quotes as I think many of us would uh, you know, not describe a trach at 15 days, 16 days, 17 days really as, as late. Um, however, I think this highlights more that there are potentially kind of two ways that centers are approaching this. Um, and I think one is that, uh, you know, even more adult appearing cohort of this uh, kind of early tracheostomy where the trach is going to be your, your primary strategy to get this patient better is going to be a wakeful state with patient rehabilitation. Um, and that's going to be, you know, again, it's even more towards an, uh, so a 16 year old um, that is primarily VV uh, ECMO. Um, and you see more in this group um, uh, that uh, like the, the outcomes are kind of, I think, better in this group, reflective of uh, that they are kind of more closely resembling the adult patients. Whereas I think the tracheostomy late group is potentially more of this, uh, where I think it often comes up in, in our center, is more of a uh, kind of secondary strategy or a rescue strategy. Of you, We kind of do our typical approach of uh, seeing if we can you know, minimize sedation as we are able, targeting a specific sedation goal, uh, allowing the lungs to rest, uh, serial uh, lung recruitment, uh, and when all of those kind of options are failed and you're not able to kind of move the patient forward and you think now we want to try and see if we can do something different. And I think this is reflecting of some of the potential differences in uh, the mortality, um, the length of the, uh, the ECMO run uh, that's reflected in this table. And so I think, again, this isn't uh, meant to say that early is better than late. Uh, and that we're, you know, like recommending or that this data suggests that to do a tracheostomy early because the outcomes are better than doing them late. Uh, that's certainly a question that I think is, is valid and worth asking. Uh, but this, I think, more reflects that there seem to be kind of several approaches to tracheostomies on ECMO. I think one is that primary strategy. Uh, and again, this is obviously a, a spectrum, a continuum. It's not as binary as what I was, I'm presenting. But I think in general, there is kind of an, it seems to be there are centers that are doing this early uh, as a primary strategy. And there are also patients that are receiving this more as a secondary. This wasn't your primary intent, but now you're buckled in for the longer run. As Dr. Friedman had mentioned, you think that in a couple of weeks, you're still going to be on and are going to need to have this patient awake. So let's do this tracheostomy now. All right. Very good. Thank you. Go ahead, Elise. Sorry, I was just going to bring up this uh, graph. Did you, um, was that sort of yeah. where you were getting with this? Yeah, so this was all 94 patients. We talked a lot of different ways about how to kind of present this uh, information. And so just looked at the kind of total ECMO run um, for all of these 94 patients and then just sorted them by the time that they're getting the uh the tracheostomy. Um, and so as you can see, it's just one, I think it is highly variable when in the ECMO run these patients are receiving a tracheostomy. And then I think two, the duration of time that folks are spending on ECMO after the tracheostomy is also, also highly variable. Um, and so uh, this was to just really try to get uh, a little bit more granular picture to highlight that variation and when we're when centers are doing this. Um, what's happening after, um, and again, highly variable. All right. Um, you guys found a trend toward increasing use of trach tracheostomies placed during ECMO in this population, although it does remain small. Why do you think this is becoming more common? And um, I'm personally curious to, to know or your thoughts on if this data would be different if you looked at a more modern cohort from 2019 through current and going forward? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I also, so I, you know, I think, again, I want to put a, a big caveat on this is that there, there's not, uh, I think, I don't know that our data, while there's a statistical difference between uh, 2015 and 2019, um, I think overall the numbers are low. Um, so again, it remains less than 5%. Um, I, I do wonder, I think that, uh, so this is something that is, uh, I think, 
more much more common in adults, um, and that there has been an explosion of adult uh, respiratory ECMO, uh, unclear reasons over the past couple of years uh, of why that would have happened. Uh, and I wonder if some of those practices or successes or failures from the adult uh, world will potentially kind of bleed over into our uh, practices. And so I, th I think it will be an interesting uh, look. Yeah, I think my gut says this is probably something that uh, we may be doing more. Um, uh, cause I, again, it's something that I think I've heard us talk about a lot more lately. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, I don't, I don't know that based on our data from 2015 to 19, I can say that, uh, what 2021 would look like, but I, my guess is it's higher. Yeah, I think, um, I think you're right. Anecdotally, at least. So kind of moving on to be respectful of time, um, what is your one big takeaway or what would you like our audience here to know about your study? Yeah, so I think the biggest things that I think, um, uh, as uh, Dr. Starr had mentioned earlier, um, as well as, uh, you know, any approach, whether it's tracheostomy, extubated or remaining intubated, all of it's gonna be a kind of multidisciplinary uh, a decision and you really want to be able to, uh, I, I think, choose a strategy that's going to be, uh, that works for, um, I think, your institution um, and it works for your patient. Um, and uh, I think overall, what I think this data shows is that tracheostomies are, I think, they're overall rare in pediatrics, much more rare in the adult uh, than in the adult population. I think centers are, are definitely doing it, um, and it can be done with a, I think, measurable risk of bleeding. Uh, and I think overall, um, it uh, is potentially something that can help you achieve a calm, wakeful state. Um, and so if in the right patient, if you have in a multidisciplinary discussion, feel that the best way to achieve that uh, rehabilitation goals is with the tracheostomy. I think it's something that be can, can be considered in this population, uh, but it's something that certainly, uh, you know, I think we will learn more from some of the adult literature moving forward. Uh, and I think learn more from uh, conversations like this and others around the country that are uh, doing it to find out what works for others and uh, what kind of practices we can uh, come together to, to uh uh, to try and make all, all the care better at our own individual centers. I think just echoing what Joe said, and uh, I think capturing really what Matt said uh, as well earlier is, I mean, this it's just hard, you know, uh, getting these kids up and awake and moving around takes real work and, you know, I think real uh, cultural investment from the entire team. Uh, and so it's not for every patient, for sure. It's for those patients that you think are going to need that kind of protracted run and that uh, you know, getting them up and moving them forward. Uh, but I do think hopefully over time, uh, we do build that cultural experience and that unit-based experience beyond our ECMO patients and uh, and share that information across and increasingly have our, our sickest respiratory failure kids uh, more increasingly awake and moving around. Um, and then if a trach is an adjunct to that, uh, fantastic. If not, fantastic. And then I think, you know, again, just echoing what Dr. Friedman said is, I mean, you know, I think sometimes uh, when we think about uh, extubating these kids, we think we are really liberating them from a lot, but every once in a while they are quite dysnic and, and having a hard time breathing. And that can also be true with the trach as well. And so some, some of these kids just are obligated to be sedated, unfortunately, I think for comfort as well. Yeah, thank you. And since I have some, since we are a uh, research group and I have two major ECMOS researchers on the line here, where do you guys think our future research efforts should be focused on either with tracheostomy on ECMO or beyond? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, one of the questions in the chat as well had mentioned whether there's anything in Ascend that could uh, potentially help answer that. I don't know, Brian, if you want to um, lead into that question too. Uh, thanks, Joe. Yeah. I think that's, uh, 
I obviously, you know, one of the things that I'm presently studying through the Ascend study is uh, trying to get a better understanding of what some of the long-term outcomes are for the children who have this, but also, you know, are there differences in outcomes based on when we initiate ECMO? Um, so obviously that's something that I think is important, but I think another place where I just feel like the field uh, is shifting a lot right now um, as, as bad and MCS kind of moves more and more towards the uh, bivalve or DTI generally, I think you're just seeing a lot more centers kind of picking up on, on that. And I think uh, just as the field is moving actively underneath us, I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, for clever observational studies that take advantage of what our natural experiment type uh, uh, study designs uh, that hopefully actually allow us to get a better insight into whether there's any differences there. Uh, and I think the other thing is, you know, um, a lot of the adult uh, Pro programs are using, you know, the cardio help for sure. And, and I think you're seeing that be more and more commonly used in a lot of our pediatric centers. But I think a lot of our pediatric centers grew up uh, in ECMO a long time ago and have kind of remnant circuits that were put together kind of piecemeal um, and have a lot of just cut-ins and things like that, like connectors and access points that that change or sorry, change uh, likelihood of thrombosis. And I just think circuit construction and understanding devices uh, and how that affects the patient in terms of, because I think a lot of what we do is we treat the circuit because we see the circuit and we impact the patient. And so I think um, getting a better sense of what's going on with the circuit and how that impacts the bleeding and thrombotic risk of patients is going to be uh, a really important part going forward as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. It looks like we have about five, well, no, I lied, two minutes left. Um, I'd like to open it up to anybody who wants to be brave and unmute or any more questions in the chat. I think there was a comment about uh, that we didn't quite talk about in terms of the desire to do Bronx that would probably potentially keep, you know, maybe push towards tracheostomy versus extubation where it's not going to be as easy to do that. Um, and I think that's a great point. Yeah, and I think there's certainly uh, practice variation among centers too and how often and when people are doing bronchoscopies and whether serial bronchoscopies are useful. So that, I yes, I feel like that's a whole nother study. And uh, it's definitely interesting to think of the utility of that as well. Thank you so much for inviting us. This was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, yeah, this is great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you guys, you guys for guys being so here. Much. Yeah, for joining us and, and for everybody for joining us. And, and uh, we have recorded this. And so we will... Um, uh, put it up on the PDECMO YouTube page for people to um, to view it when they would like. Um, and, you know, reach out to us at the at the PDECMO Gmail. It's like PDECMO ed, ed at, um, at gmail.com um, for questions or anything. Um, and we, again, appreciate everybody joining and participating. And Thank for, you so much. for Dr. Barbera and Dr. Coney for, for, for doing this with us.